Caucasians used to include Indians and Somalis, the Finnish were sometimes included in the so-called Mongoloid race, but the idea of a Latin American race has always been puzzling to me. Imagine, if you will, Mexicans referring to people from North America as Anglo-Americans. Snoop Dogg, Sitting Bull, Justin Trudeau, all of them are just Anglo-Americans because they speak English and share a vague culture. But the opposite is exactly true. Whereas in the United States they will specify if someone is black, white, Native American, Arab, even Irish or whatever, anyone born between Argentina and Mexico just becomes Latin American. This means the children of Nazis who fled to Argentina, once they landed there and speak Spanish, they're Latin American. This puts them alongside the Native Americans like the Mayan people, the descendants of African slaves, the many mixed race people, and those from Spanish stock. Also keep in mind many of these groups don't speak a Latin language, and some nations that are Latin speakers, notably Haiti, aren't included in this group. So how did all this occur? It's not like Latin American people live in some sort of post-racial utopia. In fact, in many countries, power and riches are still in the hands of the descendants of the Europeans. Well, its origin is political and probably based on white superiority within Latin America. And the story involves the American filibuster William Walker, Napoleon III, and his invasion of Mexico. But first, lapses in security are clearly very important. Cybercriminals are getting more and more skilled and pose a greater threat than ever before. Meanwhile, our passwords are sometimes the only thing keeping these criminals away from our info and finances. Thankfully, NordPass is on hand. NordPass, however, is more than just a password manager. It's the essential cybersecurity tool that makes everyone's life easier and safer. However, if you get NordPass, you don't have to worry about remembering a bunch of complex passwords as NordPass stores all of your passwords in one place, and its autofill feature actually makes signing in a lot quicker than before. So you can actually shop and browse faster, as they also secure credit card details for instance, and their data breach scanner identifies where and when a leak may have happened, and what data could be compromised. So join 14 million users by going to nordpass.com slash jabsy, or just click the link in the description. Once you're there, use the code JABSY and secure yourself online today with NordPass. To understand the Latin American race, we need to look at Spanish rule, as they had actually wanted to establish some form of racial hierarchy long before many other countries. After the Reconquista, they wanted to differentiate the old Christians of northern Spain from the Muslim converts in the south so they came up with the term blue blood. This describes how you can see the blue veins of lighter skinned people. They took this further in America and came up with a whole chart of new races. For instance, someone who has a Native American parent and a European parent is a mestizo. If this mestizo has a child with a European, well that child is a castiza. But if that castiza has a child with a European, well that child again becomes European. Otherwise, a child of a European and a Mulatu would be a Morisco, and the child of a Morisco and a European would be a Chino. If that Chino had a child with a native, well, they'd be Salta Altras. A Salta Altras and a Mulatu would then give birth to a Lobo child. This was an incredibly complicated system, which the Spanish actually documented in charts. Then, when the countries achieved their independence from Spain, each of them embarked on their own policies regarding race. Like in Mexico, they would try to make Mestizo a sort of national race to unite the people. Yet this was far from perfect, as they also killed hundreds of thousands of mainly Mayan people during the caste wars in the 19th century. But one of the most audacious plans to do with race came from Francia of Paraguay. He actually forbade men of European descent from marrying women of European descent. Therefore, within a generation, he had essentially created a completely unified nation of mixed race people. But over in Chile, they promoted their own whiteness. They often used racist language against their regional rivals, the Bolivians, which had a larger native population. They also argued that they won the War of the Pacific due to them being more racially homogenous and a superior population. But some writers like Nicholas Palacios went one step further. He argued that the Chileans were a superior race because even the mixed race people mix Spanish Gothic blood with the Mapuche people of Chile therefore producing a supreme Chilean race. In Brazil, they abolished slavery a couple decades after the United States, and in the early 20th century, they actively pursued a racial whitening policy. They encouraged immigrants from Europe and even intermarriage to gradually reduce the percent of black people in the country. 
and this largely worked, as in 1870, white people made up just 30% of the population, but in 1910, they made up 60%. However, while researching this, I did stumble upon a pretty sad expression to describe a sort of feeling of inadequacy some Brazilians have, called the Mongol complex, which I'm sure you can sort of guess the meaning of. Meanwhile, in the Americas, there were calls for unification, like in Central America and Gran Colombia. Simon Bolivar would then try, but fail to unite all of these countries within the old Spanish Empire. Obviously, they recognised a shared history, but these would dissolve, and there was no mention of a Latin American race. After all, the continent is made up of Amazonian tribes, Mayan, German communities, people of African descent, mixed race people, and a lot more. There was one term that could be seen as a forebearer though, and that is Americanos. However, to many, this term would also have included Americans and Canadians. So, it served a purpose during the Revolutionary Wars to differentiate themselves from the Spanish colonisers. But in the 19th century, over in Europe, people also began to call for unification, and in the eyes of many French people, the world was dividing into four. An Anglophone world of Britain and America, a Teutonic world of Germany and Austria, and a Russian-Slavic bloc. So, in the 1830s, they came up with the idea of a Latin race. This race included Spain, Portugal, and Italy, and was only connected due to their similar languages, but this was enough for France, and they believed that they would finally be able to challenge the dominant Anglophone world. This idea actually popped up again in the 1950s in a place you probably wouldn't expect. During the decolonisation period in Africa, the first president of the Central African Republic proposed uniting the Latin-speaking countries of the region. This once again was designed to challenge the Anglophone countries, but most leaders rejected this, and he died in 1959 before the idea really could gain any traction. However, we could still today be speaking of Latin Africans as well. But going back to the 19th century, a Chilean man named Francisco Bilbao lived in Paris around that time, and picked up on the idea of Latin nations. He, like other emigres, brought it back to the Americas, and slowly it began to take form. For instance, Juan Batista Alberti, an Argentinian, wrote, In America, everyone who is not Latin or Saxon, that is, European, is a barbarian. So for him, and many others, the whole idea of a Latin race wasn't really a unifier, but rather a better way to describe those of European heritage. Others, like the Cuban Francisco Munoz del Monte, joined him, saying, The indigenous and African, whose physical and intellectual inferiority inherently subordinates them to the more powerful and civilizing action of the Latin and Anglo-German. So, it was just Latin at this point, not Latin American. And at the beginning, it just meant white to many of them. Plus, immigration policies reflected this, as many countries welcomed Italians and the likes with open arms. But American attitudes to Spanish speakers actually played a role in the development of Latin Americans as a race. For instance, many Americans arriving in Texas described them as mongrels and the likes. The hostilities between the two groups grew after riots took place during the Californian Gold Rush, and this encouraged more elites south of the border to adopt the title Latin to challenge the American perception of them as somehow second-class citizens. They therefore put forward the idea that they were more like the French and Latin, and many saw France as a potential ally. But France was changing from monarch to republic and back again, and many within Spanish America believed republicanism was key to their identity. Hence, a French ally wouldn't always make sense. But for many non-whites, this was all meaningless. There were more indigenous and black uprisings in places like Venezuela or the caste war in Mexico. Then even the non-whites who had taken power, like Manuel Belzu in Bolivia, saw no unity between the races, as in the middle of the century, he looked to undermine the white aristocracy on behalf of the mestizo and indigenous. American expansionism grew in the middle of the century though, as private citizens launched expeditions across the region. The locals had mixed feelings about such actions. Some in Cuba, for instance, saw American expansionism as a positive, as it would help them oust the Spanish and promote democracy. Others in Nicaragua believed Americans were the children of a common mother, Republican America. And they also saw their businesses and democracy as only a benefit. Inside of Nicaragua, many actually supported William Walker, the private filibuster, taking power in the middle of the century. This took place just a few years after the Americans took over large chunks of Mexico, so many began to panic and feared more Anglo-Saxon expansion. 
Then, when Franklin Pierce actually recognized Walker's government, even the British called the USA a nation of rogues, and the Peruvians believed the American filibuster frenzy would only stop when they established an American Union. But more importantly, in 1856, a French journalist named Felix Belly called on the Europeans to act. He had some racist ideas, saying that the Spanish-speaking Americans had no business savvy and essentially needed Europeans to help. But he said Latin America and clearly defined it, calling it the Catholic countries which spoke a Romance language. One week later, Bilbao gave a speech using the exact same term, saying the Americans were almost at war with the Latin American race. They were no longer just Latin, but Latin American. This term allowed them to keep the republicanism of America, while also keeping, let's say, the heritage of Latin France. So really, the best of both worlds in their eyes. This phrase then caught on and was used in speeches throughout that year, and it came at a pretty important time. Over in America, they had just passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act, meaning the Americans were seen as more racially based, while some early Latin Americans were presenting themselves almost as the opposite, more liberal and less oppressive to other races. Yet sometimes the use of Latin American seems a little disingenuous. Like Quesada, who is considered the father of Panama, seems to have used it only when non-white people were challenging his rule, like when they rioted in 1856. So the term could be seen as a way to quell racial uprisings in the future. So in some countries, this made the new Latin Americans a lot different than the United States, as in America the majority white population were repressing a minority, but in some Latin American countries it was the minority repressing a majority. And the idea of Latin American being white is nowhere more apparent than the exclusion of Haiti. Haiti after all is a Catholic country that speaks a Romance language, and they're between other Latin American countries like Cuba and the Dominican Republic. But nobody really explains why they were excluded, but then again, they probably believed that went without saying. But in Central America, Costa Rican politicians championed the Latin American idea, probably more than anyone else. After all, they were threatened by the Americans, but they only really promoted the idea in elite circles. When making speeches to their own non-white population, they would often use religion, not race. So they called on Catholics to defend against Protestants, not people of the same race to fight against another. Costa Rica actually tried to lead the way in a continental alliance in 1856 with the signing of the Washington Treaty. This had little real impact, but it kept alive the discussion of Latin America until Walker was killed in 1860. Then the whole thing could have just been forgotten about, just like the idea of Pan-Slavism, Scandinavianism, or the Turin race. After all, by this point, the American Civil War had erupted, and obviously they weren't going to expand for a while. However, in 1861, Napoleon III appeared on the scene and invaded Mexico. He of course had notions of a grand Latin empire, and created a puppet state out of Mexico. Strangely though, by placing an Austrian on the throne of the country. Inside of Latin America, this was again seen as a threat, but on their republican ideals, not on their race. So again, poems, pamphlets and speeches were made, promoting the idea of Latin America. However, by now it was being used by French imperialists and those fighting French imperialism. Plus, Spanish liberals began publications like La America, the Spanish American Magazine, the Ibero-American Union and the Latin Race. So even the Spanish were looking to capitalise on this new idea and maybe get some influence back in their old colonies. Plus, Napoleon's actions caused outrage in the United States, and even they began to use the term, despite it originally being an anti-American creation. For instance, Henry Winter Davis, a representative from Maryland, called for the United States to respond to such invasions, and he argued, the design of Europe extended to what is called Latin America. So the idea of Latin America became cemented in people's minds, but it remained exclusively a white idea in many places, like in Chile and Argentina. There, for instance, they genocided a group of natives called the Selknam, so obviously they didn't see each other as the same race. Then Brazil began to embrace this idea, and this is the same period in which they advocated for their racial whitening policy. Though the French invasion of Mexico made the idea increasingly anti-imperialist, and towards the end of the century, a new idea took root, the idea of a Hispanic American. This gained in popularity after the Spanish-American War, which saw America seize Spanish colonies, including Latin American countries. Thus, Spain was no longer seen as a threat, and some conservatives and liberals, for different reasons, wanted to mend relations with their old colonizer. 
So, although the French alliance was off the table, some still looked to Europe, especially when American expansionism grew in the early 20th century during the Banana Wars. So, to recap, the idea of Latin American served different purposes for different people. In one regard, it helped make white elites of the region feel better about themselves, it united people to fight against imperialism, and it also united the republics to quell racial tensions and a lot more. This might seem like it made the concept weak, but really it gave it strength. It continued to grow even more when immigration to the United States grew, and the idea of La Raza was mentioned in the immigrant communities decades beforehand, but only slightly. It continued to grow ever so slightly as more immigrants arrived in the United States, but really it was in the 1960s that this old term really became a widely accepted idea. I thought I could find more examples of the term being used in the early 20th century, like when FDR repaired relations with the good neighbour policy, but even this cartoon, that is widely used online, was created in 1961, not in the 1930s at the beginning of the policy. Otherwise, so the neighbours or something like that was more widely used, but really, they often just called them by the nationality. Like, even during the Zoot Suit riots during the war, it seems that they were just mainly called Mexicans. Yet, although Latin American may not have been well used by the outbreak of World War II, it seems that Latin America was, as you can see in these newspapers. So, it was really in the 1960s that it all took off. Obviously, this was a period of great social change and civil rights. Increased immigration then played its role, but so too did the Cuban Revolution. This encouraged left-wing movements to spread across Latin America very quickly, and there was an increase in people lumping together those from Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua and the likes. Plus, the Cuban Revolution and calls for unity among the many left-wing groups really made the idea of a Latin American race a race for everybody, not just the whites or potentially mestizos. But, of course, many within Latin America still don't consider themselves to be part of this large race. For instance, when people from Guatemala and the likes were migrating north, they weren't welcomed as brothers and sisters by the Mexicans, but they were met with protests and xenophobia. As one professor said, in Latin America, there is a pigmentocracy. If you are light-skinned, you are on the side of prosperity. Many of the Central Americans are of African descent, and that makes them undesirable. Otherwise, they would be very well received. Or, it is said that Afro-Peruvians make 40% less than their mestizo counterpart, and you could really go on and on and on about racial divides in Latin America. So, there is my brief history of the term Latin American. Let me know below if you would like to see more of these, potentially covering the idea of Caucasian and the likes.